Hey guys, how are you guys doing today? Yeah. Are you enjoying your day? Yeah. Well, I'm so excited to be here and I'm so happy to see you guys here and listening. Um, Kate and I walked around and kind of stood in the back while you guys were working on your projects and this program is amazing. I hope you enjoy your day and learn a lot. I wish I had something like this when I grew up. So. Um, I figured I'd start by introducing myself a little bit and tell you a bit more about my background. Um, so I was born and raised in the Bay Area. How many people know where Concord is? Cool, yeah, East Bay. Um, so I loved growing up in Concord. Um, I love the Bay Area. Now I live in San Francisco, so as you see, I didn't go too far. Um, I work at YouTube, and some fun facts. I have a golden retriever that's me and my dog at the park taking a selfie. Um, I also have a twin sister who's also an engineer. So growing up, um, I was the first generation in my family born in the United States. Uh, my parents were born outside of the US. Um, how, raise your hand if your parents were also born outside of the US. That is a lot of you, very cool. Um, so we grew up with you know, a little bit of a different experience. We learned from our parents and we learned from you know, people around us as well. Um, I was exposed, like you, fairly early to, to technology. Um, I took a programming class in high school, but you know, it just didn't click for me at that point. Um, this programming class, they put you in a really dark lab, they tell you, um, they teach you about a computer language called C++, I don't know if you guys have heard of it yet. Um, you know, and they, and they give you different programming exercises, and honestly, it didn't really click. It wasn't that interesting. Um, it was kind of depressing being in the lab, so I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, and when it came time in high school to decide what I was going to study in college, um, I was pretty undecided. I knew that I really liked math and science, but I wasn't sure what I should be doing with it. Um, I really liked building stuff, so I was like, maybe I should be an architect, or maybe should I should try other aspects of engineering. Um, how should I decide? I ended up going to UC Berkeley, studying electrical engineering and computer science. Um, I figured I would give it a shot. Um, it's actually a really flexible major so that I could always change my mind, do something else. Maybe I could switch to the School of Architecture later, or maybe I could be a physicist later. I wasn't sure, um, but this was a starting point. And I loved it. College is amazing. It's so much more fun, at least to me, than high school and middle school. Things only get better from here. Um, I took a lot of classes, not just engineering. I took physics, Greek mythology, psychology. And what surprised me about college is that psychology was actually one of my favorite classes. I took a lot of psychology classes in, in college. Um, I loved learning about how people think, uh, human behavior, how people react in different scenarios and with other people, um, and that was really cool. I also loved my engineering classes. I loved working with my classmates to solve problems. My favorite classes were actually really similar to what you're experiencing today. You know, you're working in teams to solve really interesting and difficult problems, and we would stay all night in the lab. Some people would sleep in the lab and never go home. Um, people loved it so much, um, they would just never leave class, which is kind of funny to think about now. Um, but when you really love what you do, you want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, so I had a lot of fun in college working on these big project-based classes um, with my friends working on hard problems. I was convinced I wanted to be an engineer. I knew this was what I wanted to do. I had an amazing time in college. Uh, so fast forward a little bit. I worked for a bunch of companies out of college. I worked for Intel, I worked for Verizon, and now I'm at Google. Um, that's me on my first day at work. Um, Googlers are what we call people who work at Google. And Nooglers are what we call new employees at Google. So I'm wearing this silly hat that they give every new employee on their first day of work. Um, it has like a propeller on it and it says Noogler on it, just so you guys know what that means. It's very silly. Um, so I think of Google as a big playground for engineers. There's free food, there's free snacks, there's free soda. Um, they throw amazing parties. There are nap pods at work, so you can take a nap in the middle of the day if you want. Sounds pretty crazy, but it works. It gives you, makes you really productive for the whole day. Um, but what I think is really exciting about Google is that Google works on really challenging problems that impact a ton of people. Um, some of the products that Google builds um, are used by over a billion people, and that's billion with a B. There are only six or seven billion people in the entire world, um, and one seventh of that um, uses Google products. Uh, now I work at YouTube. 
So a lot of people don't know that YouTube is owned by Google, but for the past 10 years, um, YouTube has actually been a part of Google. It's pretty awesome. We have our own office in San Bruno, about 20 to 30 minutes south of uh, San Francisco. Um, everything is branded YouTube and is red. And as you can see, um, one of the awesome things about working at Google and YouTube is that I can bring my dog to work. So that's her in our lobby. That's her in her typical state kind of lying down in the corner of the room. As you can see, she's not that productive. Next time, I'll bring her to a nap pod. Um, and that's her just kind of in a conference room looking out, waiting on, waiting on me. Um, so at YouTube, uh, we work on a lot of really interesting problems. And YouTube is another product that's used by over a billion people around the world. And that's super exciting. Um, and at YouTube, I'm a product manager. And you might be wondering, product manager, what happened to engineering? You talked so much about how you loved engineering. Um, and life after school, it took me a while to learn this, but life after school is more like a zigzag than a straight line. Um, so now it might feel like life feels pretty linear when you're in school. Um, you, you're in elementary school, then you move on to middle school, then you move on to high school, then you go to college, and then what? It's kind of an open field. It's super undefined. And after college, it's really up to you to figure out your own path for what you love doing um, and what you should be doing um, with your career. Um, and what I didn't realize in school was that you could do a lot with an engineering background besides engineering. Um, engineering teaches you amazing skills like problem solving, thinking about really complex ideas, working with teams to solve problems. Um, and if you guys remember, I loved a variety of classes in college. I loved um, psychology and engineering, and I loved thinking about how people use products and how to build products. Um, and that's how I ended up in product management. That kind of let me um, kind of bridge my interest in technology, in science, uh, in psychology, and in design. So what is a product manager? There are a lot of ways that people describe product, product managers. Um, it's a little bit different at every company, but I think this holds true in general. So what you see here is a Venn diagram of three circles. Do you guys know what a Venn diagram is? Yeah, so there are three circles, and they all kind of intersect in the middle. Um, and that's where kind of a product manager sits. And so looking at these three circles, on the left we have UX, and that means user experience. This is what you kind of see and feel and interact with as a user of a product. So at YouTube, when you go to YouTube.com or you use the YouTube app on your iPhone or Android phone, um, every pixel that you see was designed by a user experience or UX designer. Um, so that's going to be a person who's you know, going to be more on the autistic side, but also really understands technology and also understands how people interact with products. And then the next circle over here on the right is technology. Um, this is a lot of what you guys have been doing today. So um, really working on kind of the architecting of the product, how are you going to build it, what you need to do to code it. Um, this is kind of the core of engineering and technology that you guys have been thinking about today. And then the bottom circle is business. When you work for a company, that company has goals. And, all, and each employee you know, works towards achieving the goals of that company. Um, and that's kind of what this kind of business circle describes. So this might be um, you know, maybe a company wants to make more money. And you can think about how do, how do you help the company make more money. It might be, how do we get more users? That's something we're really focused on at YouTube. How do we get even more than a billion users to use YouTube? Um, you also might want to think about who your competitors are. How do you be better than them? How do you do what you do even better so that you slide ahead of the competition? So as a product manager, you sit in between all of these different areas, and you get to think about a lot of different aspects of the product. Um, and you're kind of the glue. So I think best when I get an example. Um, so I figured I'd give you guys an example um, and kind of walk through what these different roles do. Um, so let's say your team's task is to build a car for the blind. And I noticed that some of you guys were checking out this car that I have pictured right here um, downstairs. Can any of you guys tell me what that is? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the Google self-driving car. And I feel like this is, you know, it might spur some ideas. So the task here is build a car for the blind. So you might think about how would a Google self-driving car or any kind of self-driving car help uh, a blind person. All right, so who is your team? Your team has engineers who architect and build the car. 
Um, you've got a user experience designer that I talked about before. So this person is going to design how people interact with the car. And then you have a product manager, which is what I do. So you want, you're the glue between these teams um, to help the team define, build, and launch a successful car. And this is the product life cycle. And I think you guys have seen a lot of this today, which is so awesome. Um, and so you'll probably see some of these are like familiar words to you, but let me start at design. So when you think about designing this car, you want to think about the users. And this is what the product manager, you know, your user experience designer, and all the engineers think about and work together on. Um, so how do people use the car? Um, if you're designing a car for blind people, they're going to need a self-driving car. And how do they communicate with the car? They're going to want to communicate using voice and audio. Um, you also want to think about the touch and feel of the car. Um, the person needs to be able to get in and out of the car super easily. What features do people want? Um, something that we do often is talk to users. We ask our users what they want. Um, give them an opportunity to tell us what they want, and we can think about it and build it into the product. So after those two steps, you're going to have a huge list of ideas. Um, how do we prioritize them? So obviously, the most important thing about the car is it needs to get you from point A to point B. Um, but what about all the other stuff? Um, people want to call their friends in the car. People want to find out where the nearest Starbucks is. Um, people want to you know, find out all sorts of stuff from their car. So how do we prioritize all that stuff? So we as a team figure that out and prioritize all of these ideas. And at some point, we say, you know, this is the selection of things that we built. So that brings us to the build stage. So this is where we write the code. Maybe we need to coordinate with other teams. So as a product manager, you're not going to be the one that writes the code. As an engineer, you are writing the code. Um, but in the meantime, there are a lot of other things that need to happen as well. You need to coordinate with other teams. You also need to refine the product. Um, so as you start building stuff, you end up learning more and more. So as you learn more, you might um, be able to do things that makes the product better. So you might change your original plan a little bit um, to make it better. Or you might find that something might be like way harder than you thought it was. Then, so then you can go back and you can look at alternatives and figure out how does that impact the product. Um, so there's kind of a lot of product definition that happens throughout the entire cycle. All right, and so you guys, I saw you guys doing a lot of this today. Um, you want to test your product. Um, did it work? as you planned, um, and you want to find all of the bugs. Um, another aspect of testing is you want to understand if users like it. Um, so here you could have a small group of users um, use the product and then give you feedback. Um, is this what they actually wanted? And a lot of times, that answer is in some aspects yes, and in some aspects no. So that's where you get to the next step to iterate. Do you guys know what iterate means? It basically means you're going to want to do it again. So in this iteration phase, um, nothing is ever perfect the first time. Um, you'll find that you spend some time building it, a lot of time architecting it, and also a lot of time fixing bugs. Um, so you want to spend that time to fix bugs. You want to incorporate what you learned from your user interviews, and then you want to test it again. So that's where you see um, that arrow back to test. You're just going to do this over and over again. And this is the really fun part, because this is where you can try things out, get feedback really quickly, and make the product a lot better in a short period of time. And then once you're good with that, then you launch. This is what we all work towards. But the work is never complete. You want to continue to collect feedback and iterate and do this all over again and make the product even better, make your users even happier. So this is my last slide, and I wanted to kind of talk about what I've learned over these past years. Um, and I'm hoping that it'll take you guys less time to learn than it, take, than it took me. Uh, so the first thing is you can apply engineering to anything and everything you love. Um, what I've learned is that it's not only important just to figure out like how to build things, but it's also important to figure out how you apply that to real life, how you might be able to apply that to an entire industry, how you might want to apply it to make certain people's lives better. Um, and I think engineering can make anything better. Um, the second thing is the most interesting problems can't be solved by one person. And as you've seen from my examples, and as you've seen probably from what you're working on today, most of the time you're working in teams. 
Um, unlike that computer programming class that I took in high school where they put everyone alone in a dark computer lab, um, most of the time you're working in teams. And that's actually one of the most fun parts about engineering. Uh, teamwork is everything. So the better we learn um, how to work better in teams with a lot of different people, the better products we make, and I think the more fun we have. As an engineer, you are super powerful. So you might be in charge of building something that a billion people use. If that's not power, I don't know what is. Um, what's important in that is when you build products for a billion people, those billion people are not going to be exactly like you. So you want to be able to, as a team, understand who uses your product and understand how, how that makes it better. Um, so it's really important to embrace what's different. Um, I believe, and there are scientific studies on this as well, the most successful teams are also the most diverse. And it might be anything. It could be race, age, gender, background, where you're born, where you grow up, what your favorite food is. It could be anything. Um, but having a big variety of people on a team helps you understand your users and helps you um, build everything better. And that's my last slide. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, so um, are you planning to make any new YouTube videos soon? Or? We always make new YouTube videos. There's new stuff that comes up every day. What What's your favorite YouTube video or uh, YouTube channel? Uh, I like the Diamond Minecart. Oh, yes. That's a big favorite. All right, we have another question on this side. Um, does YouTube really have that many competitors? That's a great question. So we do a lot of dis we have a lot of discussions about what our competitors are, and our competitors might be one way to think about it is a competitor might be any other app that lets you watch video. So that might be TV. Like we could be competing with Game of Thrones on HBO. We could be competing with like House of Cards on Netflix. We could also be competing with you know, other apps like Hulu. Uh, we could also be competing with um, apps like Facebook, where Facebook, you can watch video as well. Um, so we do think that there are a lot of kind of not direct, necessarily direct competitors, but other things that could take up your time instead of YouTube. So if we want to think about how do we get YouTube people to watch YouTube more, um, those are, could, could be considered competitors, too. <laughs> Well, I think different apps are good at different things. Um, so the comment was, they're not as successful as, at, as YouTube, right? Um, I think one of the benefits of YouTube is that it has huge scale. There are a huge number of people that use YouTube. Um, there are a lot of people that watch TV, too. There are a lot of people that use Facebook, but they use it in different ways. So whereas um, you might consider them a competitor in some ways, in other ways, they're not really. So I think this is a, a really interesting question to think about and a kind of a gray area. Great question. Got one over here in the front. Why did YouTube think of YouTube Red? Ah, so why did YouTube think of YouTube Red? So we found that our users really want, our power users wanted a lot more features than we currently had in the free product. But in order to give those features to them, we have to charge money. Um, so that kind of results in this complicated relationship between YouTube the creators, the people who make the videos. Um, as you saw in my original chart, like the Venn diagram of those three circles of UX, tech, and business, that's where the business bubble comes in. Um, in order to enable certain features, for example, like background playback or offline playback, um, you actually need to start charging people for that. And that's based on our relationship and our contracts with some of our creators. Um, so that's one of the reasons why YouTube Red started. Um, also, when people start paying for videos and paying for content, that means we can also spend more money creating that content. Um, so that means that you can create higher quality content for people who love watching stuff on YouTube that otherwise, you know, ads wouldn't necessarily be able to pay for. Great. We have another question on this side back at the back. Over here. Sorry, Stephanie, to your left. Do you think what you do is meaningful, and if so, how? That's a great question. I do think what I do is meaningful. 
And I think one of the reasons for that is, you, is the scale. So YouTube touches a billion people every month. Um, and I think when you have that large of an impact, what you do is meaningful. And that means that uh, when you build products, you want to be you know, very careful about what you're building. You want to understand that this has a positive impact on people. And the way we measure that is actually through a lot of experimentation. Um, so as you guys might learn from your science classes or your other engineering classes, um, experimentation is what um, kind of helps us decide whether to launch something or not. Um, so we, our goal is to make our users happy, to grow our, num our user base, uh, to help them you know, um, find what they want to watch on YouTube. Um, so in that respect, um, kind of that scale and that reach uh, makes YouTube, and I think my job, very meaningful. How many videos are posted per day? That's a great question. I think the answer is probably on the internet, but I don't know the answer right now. I think it's something like, like 20, 20 minutes of video or per second. I don't know. I don't remember. I'll have to look it up and get, get back to you. All right, another question back at the back here. Over here. Sorry, Stephanie, on this side. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so how can we create a company like YouTube? Ah, good question. I think that's a really hard question to answer. I think what was amazing about YouTube, so YouTube came out when I was in high school. And I think what they found back then, that was about like 11 or 12 years ago. Um, and I think what the founders discovered is, back then, the internet was really just starting. Like, fast internet was really just starting. So they found that uploading a video was really difficult. It took like a million steps, and there were all these different ways to do it, and no central place where you can get like a ton of videos. Um, and that's what the founders um, kind of started out thinking about. So I think one of the keys to developing a successful company like YouTube is really you know, having that insight into a problem that nobody else has solved yet. And of course, execution is super important. Not only do you have to have the idea, um, and other people are probably going to have the same idea as you, but you need to be able to execute on that. You need to be able to build a product that works really well, that scales, um, that can be used by a ton of people. Imagine if you know, YouTube kept breaking down and you could never watch your videos and like, the internet never worked. Um, that wouldn't be a very good product. So being able to make a product scale um, so that it can reach a lot of people and that it's really reliable is important to you know, building a really successful product like uh, YouTube as well. Over at the pink tables. How'd you make that filter? Like, you know, like inappropriate videos getting filtered? Like if you the click of a button. Oh, so that, are you talking about um, kind of that setting that restricts your videos? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so is the question how do you make it or why? How did you make that filter? So, um, we so we take a lot of inputs about our videos. So what happens on YouTube is, if you notice, there is a way for people to flag content. So what that means is, they can people, users like you guys and like me, can report videos as inappropriate. So when people do that, <laughs> that means that um, you know, if enough people do that, and we have algorithms that kind of evaluate the accuracy, if enough people do that, then that video is going to be kind of behind that filter. And it, just, and it basically means it's not appropriate for kind of like you know, maybe a younger person like you guys. All right, back at the green tables. So if people upload videos, do you have to approve them? No, we don't. So if people upload videos, it just goes up straight. Um, you guys can you know, work with your parents to try uploading a video, too. You'll see that it appears in like, I don't know, a couple seconds. So it's pretty awesome. And you can send it to your friends, and everyone can watch the video whenever it's uploaded. I got the pink. So there's like YouTube 360 cam. And yeah. you know how that works and why you decide to do that? 
Yeah, so we think that, so um, the question was like about YouTube, 360, how it works, why, do, why did we decide to, decide to do that? So with YouTube 360, you can actually watch videos in like 360 mode. If you haven't tried it, it's like really cool. So um, during this last, are you guys familiar? So there was a music festival called Coachella where YouTube uploaded a bunch of 360 videos. And what that lets you to do is that really gives you like an immersive experience. So a video usually like, you know, it's two dimensional, you just watch the video. What a 360 video lets you do is actually look around and look at all other kinds of things. So with a typical movie or a typical TV show, you have one focus. But a 360 video lets you look around and have a lot of different focuses depending on what you're interested in. Um, so 360 videos are like really interesting to capture. Look it up online. Um, it uses like tons of cameras to capture, and then it kind of stitches all those videos together. Um, and then um, as for why we decided to do that, we think that that's kind of another great way to watch video. It's a different experience. It's a lot more immersive um, than video is already. Back here at the green tables. Do you know if YouTube will, creating, will be creating any more things like YouTube Red anytime soon? Do I know if YouTube will be creating YouTube Red anytime soon? I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> but YouTube Red is really exciting. I know that we're going to invest a lot more in YouTube Red, getting more shows, getting a bigger variety of content, and uh, making YouTube Red a lot better. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting. Back at purple. In the front. So this is kind of related to the um, your whole phase cycle for designing something. Yeah. Do you actually know? I don't know if you know this, but do you know what phase the Google Self Driverless car is on? Uh, so if I remember, so I don't work on the Google self driving car, and I probably know just as much as you guys do actually after hearing about it. Um, but what I know is I think they're kind of in this testing phase. So they have you guys seen them on the street? It's pretty awesome, right? So you can't you can't like buy one right now. So it's kind of in that test test phase um, right before launch, and they're like iterating on it. Um, so I think that's where they're at. All right, up here at the front in the orange tables. Why did you me? Um, why did you switch from regular Google to YouTube? So when I joined um, Google, I joined YouTube directly. Um, so similar to what I was talking about earlier, you can apply. Uh, engineering to anything. I love watching YouTube. <laughs> so I was really excited to join YouTube and work on a product that I myself really like to use. Up here at Purple. Uh, what projects are you personally working on? Personally, I'm working on a lot of different products, projects to make uh, YouTube better and to make the experience better for all kinds of people. Uh, so right now, a lot of people who use YouTube use YouTube every single day, you know. Um, but there are also a lot of people who don't use YouTube every single day. Um, so we want to think about, for those people, um, how do we make it better? Maybe they don't know how to use all the features. Maybe they're not aware of all the stuff that um, YouTube has for them to watch. Um, so those are one of the projects that I'm really excited about. Right up here at the front. Uh, if I don't remember, I really don't. I really do not want to rant about the copyright system for YouTube. I just <laughs> want to ask. Wait, what was your dog's name again? Swarly. <laughs> Good name. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a question about the yeah, copyright yeah, system? Yeah. Yeah. How how exactly does the copyright system work? Yeah. So this is a very long conversation, but I'll try to give you guys like, uh, like a very short summary. So what happens when you're a creator, so when you upload videos onto YouTube, um, you can kind of mark that as intellectual property that you own as a creator. Um, so if you like upload a video, so if like you're, let's say you're ABC and you upload like an episode of Modern Family. I don't know if they do that, but maybe they don't. So you can actually mark that as you know, your property, your intellectual like, thing. Um, when other people um, upload the exact same video, we notify ABC. So we say, hey, this, this person has uploaded a video that you uploaded and you claimed as yours. Um, and at that point, um, ABC can decide what to do. So they have a couple of options. They can say, hey, that's fine. That person can have their video up. Um, but 
I want to run ads on it. So, that, so ABC can say, oh, I'm going to run ads on that video, and then I'm going to collect money from it because it's my intellectual property, but I'm going to leave that video up. Um, they also have the option to take it down. So if someone like rips off a video <laughs> from another source, um, and it's someone else's property, we want to make sure that that original uploader has a choice of what to do. Well, I think, you know, for copyright strikes, that's something that we're working on to be more user friendly. Yeah, yeah, because for kids, yeah, because I always have trouble with copyright. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, tricky. It's very complicated. Yeah, sometimes the copyright system can feel like a joke to some or something. Yeah, and I think part of that is, you know, we don't, we need to do a better way of commute, have a better communication of what exactly happens and more input for uploaders like you to understand what's going on and to tell us what's happening. Um, so a lot of this is based on machine learning. So, you know, there are machines that actually try to figure out if this video is the same as the other video. Um, this gets really complicated, but, you know, you can start talking about fair use and talk about, like, there is a gr big gray area in terms of what you, can upload legally and what you can't. Um, so that's where kind of, you know, this gray area lives. And I agree, I think we could do a lot better to help users, you know, have a better experience. Yeah. All right, we've got a question back here at Pink. Why did you decide to go to Google and YouTube to work there? Yeah, so I think I talked a lot about about this um, when I was going through the presentation, but I think the most exciting thing about Google and YouTube is that it reaches so many people. Um, and I feel like um, you can have a lot of impact when you work on things that reach, you know, like a huge proportion of the entire world. Um, and I love watching TV, so I think that was icing on the cake. Got a question up here at the front. You ready? Um, how does YouTube make money? How does YouTube make money? YouTube makes money today primarily by ads. So when you watch a YouTube video, sometimes you'll get like a, a pre-roll ad before you start watching the video. You'll see like display ads when you're watching the video too, little banners that pop up. You might see ads on the side uh, when you're watching a video. Um, that's how YouTube makes money. So what happens is advertisers, let's say, um, you know, it could be anything. Let's say Toyota wants to run an ad on YouTube. Toyota can say, hey, hey YouTube, I'm gonna give you these videos to run um, before you show like your normal YouTube video. And they actually pay us for it. Um, they pay YouTube and YouTube shares that money with the creator, the person that uploads the video. Um, so it's kind of like advertiser pays us money, we keep some of it and we give the rest of it to the person who uploaded the video. Another one at Pink. Uh, so what do you need to be a product manager? Like what skills do you need? Yeah, so I think a lot of different skills help you become a product manager. Um, product management is kind of new. Um, so traditionally it's been, you know, a lot of engineers, kind of like me, who started as an engineer and then started doing, you know, more product management. Um, you know, there are people who aren't, you know, engineering majors who become product managers too. I think the most important thing is to be, to be a really good problem solver and to be able to work with teams really well, because most of the times you're not, you know, going to be the one who's coding. You're not going to be the one who's manufacturing that car in the example that I talked about, but you're going to be the one that helps bring, bring teams together. Um, so good at problem solving, bringing teams together, and also understanding users. So being able to empathize with your user, even though they're not going to be like you, uh, is really important. Back here at the green team. When a channel gets taken down and another one does, sometimes one gets another chance. Why does that happen? Uh, you know, I'm not sure of the details on that. There is a big team that works on these kinds of problems. I know that over time things do change because we are spending a lot of time figuring out how to make the experience better for uploaders. So I don't know if there's something weird like going on with that creator, or maybe you get several chances. I'm not really quite sure. All right, we have time for just a couple more questions. So I think there's one on the purple team. So are there going to be new features that are going to come up for YouTube? Yeah, I think we're always working on making the experience better. Uh, 
So yeah, I keep using YouTube and find out. All right, back at the green, green team. OK, so how come YouTube doesn't deal with like uh, those YouTubers who copy some other YouTubers videos? So what, what was the question? What happens when YouTubers copy other YouTubers videos? Yeah, like um, aren't they like banned or something? Aren't they banned? Oh, what happens? Um, I think it will depend on um, it will depend on a couple things. It was kind of like the conversation we had around copyright. So let's say you know a YouTuber uploads a video and they kind of claim ownership on that. For if someone else you know uploads the same video, that original uploader has a choice of what to do. They can leave that video going. They can also take it down. Um, if you as an uploader continually like just copy other people's stuff post it and try to make money off of it, even though it's not yours. Eventually, you might be banned, um, but it's probably not very common. We've got another one over here at Purple. What is YouTube Red? What is YouTube Red? Cool. Well, YouTube Red um, is a pretty new part of YouTube where um, you get YouTube as you know it today, but with a lot of extra features. Um, one of those extra features is that you can listen to um, anything offline. So let's say you need to go in the car and then you're not going to have internet access. You can listen, you can kind of download a bunch of stuff and then you can listen to it in the car. Um, you can also listen to stuff in background. So let's say you're on your phone and maybe you're like on the go, you want to listen to music while you're doing something else. Um, that's what YouTube Red lets you do as well. Uh, and YouTube Red also gives you um, the ability to watch like a lot of other content that's not available to regular YouTube users. So um, PewDiePie has a series, for instance, that's available only uh, in, on YouTube Red. Um, and you're going to start to see more and more of that. So it's super exciting. All right, at the back here with the green team. How do you make 360 videos? Ah, cool question. Um, I actually encourage you to Google this because I think I won't do justice explaining it, but in order to make 360 videos, you have to use like a, this whole rig of lots of cameras. And it spins around. So when it spins around, it collects your environment um, like from every single angle. And then afterwards, a bunch of machines, a bunch of servers stitches those videos together so that when you as a user watch the video, um, you get a really smooth experience, and you don't even notice that maybe like 10 cameras captured uh, what you've been seeing. So it's really awesome. You can find a lot of videos on this on YouTube, actually. So take a look. Right, we have a question up here. Does YouTube Red let you watch videos offline? Like watch? Yeah, so you can, you can download videos, and you can you know, watch it on your phone, uh, let's say when you're like, on a plane. You can listen and watch, yes, the, with the offline. So, um, yeah, so uh, basically, uh, I have one question left. And uh, what's your YouTuber name like when you play games and stuff? <laughs> when I play games. So actually, my account, I have an account for my dog. Um, I think her name, her YouTube channel is Swarrel Sparkly or maybe Swarl Sparkly the dog. So I encourage you to find her and follow her yeah. and subscribe to her. So you, you make YouTube videos, right? I, the only videos that I make are on my dog's account. But I work on the product. Um, what's your? So I work, on, I work on the actual like YouTube website and the YouTube apps. So when's your new video going to come out, and what's it going to be called? So the difference between me and a YouTuber is that a YouTuber is going to like create videos and they're going to upload videos. What I work on is the technology behind what they use to like watch and upload videos. So I am def my videos are not as awesome as all the other you know YouTubers that you watch. Um, they're really just videos of my dog. All right, 
I just have one last question. We've had so many amazing questions from the audience today. And as we're wrapping up, I'm wondering if you can share your words of advice or wisdom for these middle school students that are very excited already about all the, yeah. this technology. What would you share with them as they're heading off into their futures? Yeah, I think the main thing is be open-minded and try as many things as you can. Um, I think there are so many aspects of engineering uh, that there are to explore. Um, you know, there's working with teams, there's actually coding, you can build hardware, there's so many things. And the only way to understand if you like it or not is to try it. So have an open mind, try a lot of things, bring your friends along, um, work in teams. Um, and to me, that's the best part about engineering. Excellent. Thank you so much. You've been an amazing guest speaker and rock star here. Big round of applause for Stephanie, everybody. Thanks, guys.